Make sure you download the Woodward Sports app in the App Store and the Google Play Store today. Take Woodward Sports with you wherever you go and listen live on your phone or mobile device. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for tuning in here on the Morning Woodward Show on the Woodward Sports Network, also featured on The Roar on 99.1, 93.5, and 94.7 HD2. Good morning, Adam and Jeff Remote. Can, can, can I see Jeff's <laughs> chair? I, just, I just, can we look at Jeff? Look at Jeff. Oh, what a sexy Jeff, dude. Jeff, you look great today. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Jeff lives in the Upper Peninsula, if you guys didn't know. So Jeff couldn't make it today, but he's joining in via VMix. What's up, buddy? What's going on? Yeah, you can see the egress. It does look like I'm in some sort of bunker barricaded out here, but oh my gosh. Yeah, it's all right. It's all right. We're going to have a great show. Oh, man. <laughs> all right, Jeff. Well, listen, let's get started. Sure. All right. In a wild turn of events, all, I would say the last, what, five, six, seven days, really, we've been given so much information on Jim Harbaugh will leave Michigan if given yep. an NFL offer. And then we hear he's flying to Minnesota for an in-person interview, which I think it's fair to say you can expect, all right, they're going to interview him and likely offer him the job. And what a turn of events. It is reported they didn't offer him the job, and now he's staying at Michigan. He tells Ward Manuel, this will not be a reoccurring issue. I will stay at Michigan for as long as you will have me. And I don't have a problem with that. And I don't have a problem with him pursuing a head coaching job in the NFL. You know why? Because he knows he's behind the eight ball at Michigan. Brian Kelly, good coach could only do so much at Notre Dame. I make fun of Notre Dame all the time. This morning, I will not. He did a good job with a Midwest program that doesn't have any recruiting capabilities of any team down south. And Michigan doesn't even have the NIL capabilities to keep up with some of these teams. And it's Michigan. Harbaugh knows where he's at. He reportedly wants to win a, a Super Bowl and a national championship. Well, that can still be done. He's young. But I'm surprised the Vikings said no. I thought it was actually a really good fit. The current GM and him have a working relationship back from their time in San Francisco. But my goodness, Harbaugh staying at Michigan. Jeff, should fans be upset with how this was handled for the last, what, two, three, four, five weeks? I mean, you could say months, really. Yeah, it's funny, going back to D'Antonio, people gave him flack for doing something similar, uh, obviously retiring, but with um, Jim Harbaugh going to Minnesota with that nine-hour interview, I think the biggest shock to me is when we found out he had the entire nine-hour interview and he wasn't offered the job. I think that changed things for him because um, then Kevin O'Connell was still the other finalist and Jim, I don't know if it was an assumption going into that interview that he probably most likely would get that job before he left the interview. But um, by the time it was over and, and he left without one, I think he kind of thought to himself and, and weighed his options. And, and listen, Michigan's obviously elated. They stated in the, in the statement he's back. And, and I think the reason the Vikings had interest in the first place, you already mentioned it, is the history between the Minnesota Vikings GM dating back to San Francisco. And we don't know how – I'm not going to sit here and say you heard reports. I don't know how the interview went exactly. Um, but I, I think not receiving an initial offer after that nine-hour interview during primetime recruiting time in college football, I think the timetable wasn't really favorable for him, and I, I, maybe the timing as well. But I have no problem with him going out and, and at least trying and getting an interview with the Minnesota Vikings. We all know Jim eventually wants to return to the NFL. It's just a matter of when. And I thought the most interesting part of his statement was telling Michigan – I'm just here for as long as you need me. I, I, I'm curious to see how long that is. But at the end of the day, I, I think Michigan's happy he's back. It depends who you're talking to. You know, Whenever, some people like to say Ohio State's happy he's back. Or, but from my perspective, I think Michigan is more happy he's back. Well, yeah, look, Michigan fans should be happy. I mean, that is their best coach since Lloyd Carr. He right. has delivered them a Big Ten championship. The first coach to do it since Lloyd Carr. Like, yes, the first six years, up and downs, I get it. I get it, Michigan. But that's what you've been. And the guy actually finally came through for the first time. Actually had a much better recruiting class this year. Yep. I'm, I'm really excited about where Michigan is going moving forward. But 
should fans be upset with how it was handled? No, I think it's fair for them to be kind of like, all right, <laughs> this was extremely uncomfortable. Had he give, had he been given a job or offered a job, would he have taken it one and two if he did? Well, we would be in the middle of a coaching search on National Signing Day. I, I get the optics weren't the best. I really do. But sorry, when you have a damn good coach, and Jim Harbaugh is a damn good coach, he's going to get interest. He's going to get people looking at him. And he's always going to look at the NFL. Sorry, guys. NFL is, there's one of one. It is the king of all sports. There's nothing like the NFL. And if a job opened up that made sense to him, and I think he thought Minnesota was a good job, clearly. He was interested enough to go and fly in. And I think he had the expectation that he would get the job. But yeah, we'll get more information on that a little later. Anthony Broom joining us around 8.30. I'm excited for that. We'll ask him more about Harbaugh. But I do want to finish with this. Michigan, you need to make a decision. Are you all in on your football program, or are you just happy to be there? Michigan State wasn't just happy to win 10 games and happy to win a Peach Bowl. They re-upped Mel Tucker, invested into an NIL, uh, excuse me, an NIL program, mm -hmm. and they're trying to make big moves in the next four to five, six years. It's a long-term project. Michigan, what are you going to do? The ball's in your court. If you think you're going to keep Harbaugh with the same status, the same recruiting style, and no NIL project, good luck. We can give Texas A&M all the crap they want. They have the number one recruiting class because of NIL. Not because of Jimbo Fisher and Texas A&M. When's the last time Texas A&M was relevant? Johnny Manziel? Johnny Football. Last time they were ever relevant, they pull off a number one recruiting class, a heavy, heavy part of it. Yes, obviously, it's an SEC school. It's a, good, it's a good football product school. No problem with it. Having said that, it is not Alabama, Georgia, Michigan in terms of brand imaging. But they have the number one recruiting class because of NIL. Yeah, sorry. And I'm not even mad at them that they relied heavily, uh, heavy on NIL to get these players. What's the problem with that? That's the whole point of NIL. Pay players, and you'll be able to convince them to come to your school. Fair? Michigan, you want to catch up? That would be extremely ideal. <laughs> get, get with the program, Michigan. Jeff, what do you think? Especially, especially with Mel Tucker over there in East Lansing and what he's been able to do already while Jim's been making this decision. You're already seeing guys sign. He's got the guys that are transferring. So I'm probably most interested to see how Jim – uh, matches up with Mel Tucker just in terms of the NIL stuff because it seems like Mel's already having some success. I mean, I, I have no doubts about Mel Tucker in Michigan State. I really don't, and I do about Michigan. Why? Because of their attitude. When are they going to change? And, yes, this is Jimbo Fisher's first full year, but that's the point. The wonders NIL money does. Nobody's clamoring to play for Jimbo Fisher in Texas A&M. It's, again, it's a good school. Don't get me wrong. But the number one recruiting class? Yeah, something's up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Look, no, Jeff does not have COVID, Ryan. Jeff does not have COVID. <laughs> no, not listen. I, I, the rooms are pretty bad. I, I, I will admit but, that. But you know what? Uh, Drew, I'm glad you brought this up. That number one overall class might have something to say about becoming a huge brand. Clearly, f kids are feeling good about the brand at Texas A&M. Drew, what I would tell you is that the brand doesn't matter as much as it used to. It has pull. Southern Cal, we all know Southern Cal. We all know Michigan, right? Oklahoma, et cetera, et cetera. That is not the point anymore. We're at a point where these college athletes can be paid. And shame on them, really, if they don't take advantage of it. If you're a top recruit and A&M is offering you $350,000 a year to play for them and Alabama is offering you, what, a car? You're, going, you're taking the money at A&M, and you probably have a better chance to play anyways. Yeah, look, A&M are showing how it can be done, how it can improve your football program, and who knows, A&M may be a really good football team in the next two, three years. 
but Michigan needs to adopt a more modern way of recruiting, and it has to involve NIL. And for a school that is so well-funded, it is shocking to me that they are so reserved on going all in on NIL. I'm not saying you have to dish out $50 million a year. Don't get me wrong. But hey, give your coach something to work with, not just Jim Harbaugh, any coach, so they can mm-hmm. try to catch up to an Ohio State, try to catch up to a Georgia. Not hard. We got to go to break, Maddie. All right. Well, guys, when we come back, we're talking about Dan Campbell being a little bit nervous about Aaron Glenn, but first we need to talk about Cintron. Well, listen, I'm at home, and God dang, I wish I had a Cintron. All right, Cintron <laughs> World is an aspirational lifestyle beverage brand with a line of sparkling flavored energy beverages, premium bottled water, and revitalizer shots. If you're looking for premium ingredients, long-lasting energy, and or hydration, essential vitamins, and great taste, Cintron is your top choice. Buy online at CintronWorld.com and use the promo code REDWINGS10. Save 10% with shipping included. Don't forget, drink it, live it with Cintron. He's going deep, right side. Oh, that is Edwards out there. He goes up in the air at the goal line. Hey, it's Greg Edwards here, wanting to welcome the sports marketing agency to Woolworth Sports Network to the family. Glad to have you guys. For the last decade, the sports marketing agency has literally leveraged athletes around issues such as mental health and substance abuse. Sports. We just wish they'd love us back. Detroit Sports for Detroit Sports fans. Woodward Sports. Welcome back. Thanks for joining us here on the Morning Woodward Show on the Woodward Sports Network. Dan Campbell is a little bit nervous about losing Aaron Glenn. Thinks he's a perfect fit for the Saints. Adam, what do you think? I think he is a perfect fit for the Saints. He's been there. He's been a coach there. I believe he played for New Orleans as well. He was there with Dan Campbell. He was there, obviously, under Sean Payton. Look, I think Aaron Glenn is the good fit, but again, what's what are the Saints' expectations? Yeah. Right? What do they plan on doing? Do they plan on going in a full rebuild, understanding, look, honestly, even if we bring in a really good coach, this is going to take a year and a half before we have a good product on the field? Or is it, yeah, you know what, maybe we have a Hugh Jackson situation. Like, if I'm a coach, black or white, I look at the same situation, that's a losing situation for the next year and a half. That's a tough situation to overcome. I'm going to have to get rid of Kamara, probably Michael Thomas. I'm going to have to get some, get rid of some of my better players because of our cap situation. And is again, is Aaron Glenn the perfect fit? I do think so. I think he's totally the guy for the job. But who wants that job right now? <laughs> why, hasn't, why haven't the Texans announced their head coach? Who the hell wants that job? <laughs> Davis Mills? Deshaun Watson's getting a rub and tug. He's not even available for... <laughs> I know you'd like that one, Jeff. He's not even available to play in the NFL right now. It's unbelievable. So, yeah, look, I don't blame Dan Campbell for being nervous. Aaron Glenn is a damn good defensive coordinator. Mm-hmm. And if probably if he stays another year in Detroit, he will likely get offered another job next year. But you guys have to remember, there are one of 32. Each of these individual jobs are one of 32 jobs. There are currently four available. Are you going to be the guy that's going to pass up on a potential NFL job? That's a hard ask. You don't know if you'll get hired in the next cycle. This team is offering me a job right now. And we don't know if the Saints have offered Aaron Glenn. But it looks like the Saints might potentially be looking internally. And I think that's the smarter move, to be honest. Because I'm not sure how you can do an interview with any outside candidate and say, hey, come lose for two years. And let's start from there. What coach one wants to lose? What player wants to lose? Like That's not a thing, but that's the reality. Likely, they will have to go into a rebuild. And is there an outside candidate that wants that job? Or are they comfortable promoting internally and riding that out for three years and then seeing, okay... Is this the coach, or do we move on and get the guy to take this team to the next step? That has always been the NFL. Black, white, doesn't matter. It's a two, three-year vicious cycle. But 
I expect Aaron Glenn to be back in Detroit. Jeff, I'm not sure what you think. No, you hit it right on the head. I'm glad you said that this is how the NFL works. You're going to get talented assistants. And from day one, obviously Anthony Lynn didn't work out. But Dan Campbell, from an outside perspective, has done a good job getting good assistant coaches under him. So, I mean, even Aubrey Pleasant, for example, these guys aren't going to be here for a very long time. They're too talented. So with Aaron Glenn, and I'm gl so glad you brought that up, about one of 32 jobs, of course. So you're going to want any job, any interview you can get. But Hugh Jackson alluded to this yesterday when talking about just minority coaches. And this isn't about, I don't believe the Saints, or, this isn't about the Saints, but in general, when you're interviewing minority, minority coaches like Aaron Glenn and, and they're getting an opportunity to be a head coach, ideally sometimes – it's hard to say yes to those situations knowing you're going to go in and, and, and have a rebuild. You're going to lose games. Um, it, it's hard. But with Aaron Glenn, I believe he's a perfect fit for New Orleans. I mean, he already has a connection with a lot of those secondary players, Marcus Williams, Marshawn Lattimore. He was a big part in their development. So as a Lions fan, of course, I'm nervous. Uh, but the reality is I'm comfortable because I know, listen, it, Aubrey Pleasant, this is a guy I've been doing a lot more research on, and he's been given the D.C. role at the Senior Bowl, and he's been do he's been doing nothing but impress. And you saw what he did with the secondary already. Um, he was the secondary's coach all year, coaching Okuda, Amani Awari to a career season. So he's got it in him. So if Aaron Glenn were to worst case scenario go to New Orleans, I'm comfortable with who would replace him. But no doubt, Aaron Glenn's too damn talented. Even if he's here for another year to get more experience, there's going to be another team that's going to request an interview with Aaron Glenn. So I, if I'm Aaron, it's a perfect opportunity for him. I have a question. And I would appreciate if everybody, not only in this room, but at home, would answer this honestly. <laughs> Hon seriously. Uh, this is a very serious question. What the hell is Hugh Jackson doing? <laughs> now, if he came yeah. out and said, I was offered money to lose games in Cleveland, but I declined it, and I just went 1-31 in during my two years there, I'd be like, okay, yeah, stand up, dude. <laughs> you took the money. And not only did you take the money, the money was sent and received to some of your, you know, your local charities that you work with and your private charities. Like what? You can't what? You, can't you can't come out and say Jimmy Haslam paid me to tank and complain. You took the money. <laughs> that, like, has anybody not brought this up? I haven't seen anybody <laughs> complain about this and it like drives me nuts. Like you can't complain about something when you actually we're part of it. Like, yeah. what? <laughs> Brian Flores was mad enough to say, F you, no, I'm going to win football games. I'm a damn coach. I'm a damn good coach. Watch this. Wins 8 of 9 to end the year, beats Bill Belichick twice. Jimmy Haslam offers Hugh Jackson money. He says, yes, nobody has a problem with this. <laughs> nobody? Jeff? Somebody? Oh, I, I, Does hey, anybody know it's the freaking hypocrisy here? Oh, yeah. Uh, no, hey, listen, I have a problem with it because you listen, Brian Flores, when he first came out and, and came out and went on get up and talked about the whole situation. The first thing they asked him about with the hundred thousand per loss was he's like, absolutely not. I'm a head coach first. I want to win games. Hugh Jackson to say, like, yeah, I, I took the compensation, but he offered me to lose games like, eh, well, we can blame Jimmy Haslam, but we got to look at Hugh Jackson as well. Why? Why are you taking the hundred thousand dollars or whatever the payment was to lose? I don't, I don't understand. If you're gonna well, that's the thing because Hugh Jackson should know. He's an he's an African American. He knows how hard it is to get a head coaching job, and he had one. And y you think losing games is going to get you? He doesn't have a second job for obvious reasons. I don't think anybody thinks he's like a very good coach or that he has a very high upside ceiling. But the fact that you have a right. one in thirty-two record, there's no chance in hell you get another job. You can't. And you me? took compensation. <laughs> I can't believe he actually came out and said that. That is unbelievable. Yeah. Like he act look, if he came out and said Jimmy Haslam offered me money during my time, but I said no. But listen, we didn't have a good football team. Uh, I didn't coach the best I could, and clearly we went one in thirty-two. The record speaks for itself. I would love that answer a hell of a lot more than yeah, I took the money. Yeah, it went to my charity. Right. But it wasn't my fault. <laughs> Holy hell! But he's a bad guy. <laughs> Well, He's look, I'm not even, yeah, like, <laughs> you can't call Jimmy Haslam a bad guy if you accepted that bounty, basically. Like, what? I Look, I think it's scummish. Don't get me wrong. And if it's true that Stephen Ross did offer, and there's evidence that he did offer $100,000 to Brian Flores per loss, 
I think he should be forced to sell, just like any team. And if, again, you mm -hmm. deep dive into the Cleveland Browns situation, they should be forced to sell. That is so unacceptable. I brought this up about Lions fans yesterday. Why should Lions fans have to endure intentional losing? Why? Why? They pay their hard-earned money. So do the Cleveland Browns fans. So do the Miami Dolphins fans. That is so unacceptable and egregious. My goodness, if I'm a Cleveland Browns season ticket holder, I am going back to those two years, and I am requesting a full refund. Oh, for sure. For my tickets yeah. that year. It, it, for sure. And Adam, I'll one-up you. What about the players? I mean, these I guys are on the field potentially risking career-ending injuries for a game that you're, the, the owner's telling the coach, listen, just try a little less. Let's try and lose some games. Like, there's guys that are actually risking their lives out here. So it's it's incredibly disrespectful, and it goes to the big point that owners and players – there's a there's a disconnect. There's owners that think, well, this is a one big game. We can we can pay to lose Stephen Ross. Like, it's it's almost idiotic that that they think that players would go out there and intentionally try to lose for whatever reason um, and put their bodies in harm's way. It's it's inexcusable. Again, I find it fascinating. Like, I get Hugh Jackson's point of view. He's trying to come out and say, yes, this does happen. This is a thing. It happened with me. But you, like, you accepted it, man. <laughs> You're not coming out and saying like, yeah, you know, Jimmy Haslam offered me money. I said, no, it caused a rift. Uh, we weren't happy with where the team direction was going. I wasn't happy with the player personnel. And, you know, it ended in a bad way in Cleveland. <laughs> it wasn't even that. Right. He accepted it. Holy hell. Holy freaking hell. I can't believe it. <laughs> I really can't. No. And nobody's even like bringing it up in a big way. Or like it's, oh, yeah, it's not a big deal. Yeah, it took money. Yeah. So you mean... He made 1.6 million basically that first year. And then the second year <laughs> made 1.5. Good for him. Don't get me wrong. But you can't come out and have it both ways. They're paying and I'm accepting. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. It doesn't. Yeah. But look, mm. we, we have a few minutes left. So I, I do want to finish it this way. Uh, moving off from Aaron Glenn and Darren, uh, excuse me, Dan Campbell. Jeff. Here we are. We saw Flores on TV yesterday. Very well measured. I'll say this, and then I would like whether your response, question, whatever it may be. What I saw just in general over the media in the last 24 hours are people that people are willing to get behind Brian Flores, and I like that. And not only that, I saw the human element of Brian Flores, which I think is more important than even the football side, okay. which is he said, I felt I was humiliated by receiving a text on the 24th that I had gotten the job for a job I was interviewing three days later. Yeah, that's pretty embarrassing. Imagine, I'll put it this way, Jeff. Imagine you were applying for to work at the Woodward Sports Network. All right. And I had your number. And your interview was set for February, I don't know, 7th. And I texted mm -hmm. you. And I said, Jeff, congratulations, bud. So excited to have you part of the team. Uh, they, they think so much of you at Woodward Sports. And you haven't even interviewed yet. I'd be like, say what? It, thank you. Yeah. Uh, it is embarrassing. <laughs> it, it's really yeah. embarrassing. So I, I don't know what's next in the Brian Flores case. Who knows legally what he can fight, what he can win in a court of law. Again, winning in the court of public opinion and the court of law are two completely different things. Deshaun Watson to this day is innocent. That's the truth. To this day, he's innocent until proven guilty, right? That, that is our country. And that is not a bad thing. <laughs> but what you can prove in court is totally different than a conversation we can have freely and publicly jeff i don't know what's next for brian flores what i will say is it's going to be interesting to watch what do you think and it, <clears throat> with brian flores to me it's sad that you know i have such an admiration for him and, and his courage obviously and him acknowledging the fact that i may never get an nfl job again but this is the, the reality it's bigger than football and for a guy to realize that and make a stand against that especially the accusations against you know the denver broncos the, the giants the dolphins and I thought it was ridiculous that the Broncos came out with a statement, 
20 to 30 minutes after Brian Flores is like 60 page, uh, you know, explanation of what happened. And all the Broncos, the Denver Broncos said was, we have notes of the interview. We have recollection of the interview. Like it's, it's honestly, it's sad because I think a lot of things are going to get exposed over the next, hopefully couple weeks as more people come forward. Hugh Jackson um, being one of the anomalies in this situation, but hopefully more coaches come forward with their experiences. And Brian Flores doesn't have to stand alone because obviously he's a credible guy. He's, he's a guy that's respected among not only players, but tons of coaches. Uh, obviously, he was under Bill Belichick for a very long time. So uh, I don't think anyone's going to look at Brian Flores and think, well, well, maybe there is some BS to that. I, everything he's been saying, it's been out of the truth. Um, and that's what kind of hurts me to see like organizations like Denver Broncos try and pull a fast one and call Brian a liar, even though Brian's risking his entire career to just have a point taken. And that the point is, is disrespect you know, towards minority coaches and not giving them fair opportunity. So I honestly, I hope things change for the better. And this is one of those days in NFL history where you can look back on and say, Brian Flores made that stand and, and it caused a lot of uproar. But until then, really don't know because it's the NFL at the end of the day and black, Brian Flores could very well be blackballed and this situation would essentially resort itself. So hopefully we do something with it. It's positive. Yeah, I definitely don't think he'll be standing alone by any means. I think there's a lot of people out there that, out there that really support him and that will stand behind him. But uh, we got to go to break. When we come back, we've got a special guest joining us. We're talking about Jim Harbaugh again. Uh, but first, we need to hear about Guardian Alarm. All right, listen, guys, we're talking about Aaron Glenn. Aaron Glenn leaving the Detroit Lions. Well, hopefully he doesn't. And I'll talk about uh, Guardian Alarm because Guardian Alarm – Listen, guys, they are the most clutches alarm system on planet Earth. And, guys, let's be honest. With Guardian Alarm, they get it. And a good defense on and off the field helps you feel secure. And Guardian Alarm has state-of-the-art technology that helps you feel safe, all with 24-7 local monitoring. You can control lights and temperatures. You can detect smoke and carbon monoxide. It will even let you lock and unlock your doors. Call this number, 800. Stay, stay out. out. Get the hell out. You hear you can hear fish all the way from my house. 800, stay out. Stay Guardian out. Alarm was Get entrusted for over 90 out, years at keeping families safe. Hi, I'm Kay Cunningham. I'm proud to partner with Hall Financial, the mortgage company known for five-star service. Don't just take my word for it. Check out their 5,000 five-star reviews for yourself. Go to callhallfirst.com and get started with your five-star experience today. You don't have to go to the beach, man. You don't have to get your butt crack full of sand. You just need the little chili peppers, man, to get that glowing beach chili peppers. Monday, February 21st from 11 to 1 p.m., join Woodward Sports and Big D Energy for the grand opening of the Berkeley Chili Peppers Tanning on Woodward between 11 and 12 Mile. Come hang and join the Pepper Club. Best deals on unlimited tanning. You just need a little chili peppers, man. Detroit alternative to the normal sports blah 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 it's Woodward Sports welcome back thanks for tuning in here on the morning Woodward show on the Woodward Sports Network of course make sure you're following us on Instagram Twitter TikTok Facebook Twitch all the above download the Google Play download the app on Google Play and Apple and of course download the podcast wherever you may listen whether that's Spotify Apple Amazon Music or Google Play Adam, we have our special guest with us, or do we not? I mean, <laughs> look, he's one of my favorite guests that we usually get on, Anthony Broom. Anthony, good morning, buddy. I know you've had a, probably a hell week of the last, what, 34, <laughs> 48 hours. God knows what the hell you've been going through. Uh, it's, it's more like uh, the last seven years have, have aged <laughs> me like U U.S. presidencies. So, um, <laughs> surprise, we're back. We're doing, we're doing, we're running it, running it back. The band's back together. So crazy times. I, I did not expect that. Uh, I'll tell you what, I did not expect him to go back to Michigan either. I really, and look for, by the way, everybody publicly shaming any reporter or anybody just doing their job, reporting information, go F yourselves. Honestly, you, you guys are so annoying. All the information was pointing towards Harbaugh leaving. But regardless, I'll, I'll take care of those people later. I want to talk to Anthony right now. Anthony, my, my first question for you is, if Jim Harbaugh decides to walk next season, where does that leave the program? And to be honest, if he had walked yesterday, this team would have been in the middle of a coaching search on National Signing Day. 
it would have been a disaster. And the optics of all this really just didn't add up. I'm not sure why it took so long. Anthony, I never heard of a leak that showed me an offer on the table, a big offer on the table to keep Harbaugh. I'm not sure what the hell I'm supposed to be thinking of the situation even moving forward. There, there was and is an offer on the table from Michigan. And I think what the intent from them uh, was is that, hey, you know, Harbaugh clearly has these intentions or this itch to get back to the NFL. And I think that after what what the last year was for them, after the, the contract and taking a reduced salary, I think that they were, I don't know if respectful of it is the right word, but I think that they were content to let him feel this process out on the NFL end of things. Now, do I think a monetary offer that was a little bit higher from the Michigan end of things and, and locking this down probably puts this to bed weeks ago? Yeah, I do. I think there was work to do there as well. And, and there's going to be work uh, to do now that these two parties are coming back together. Um, you know, I know I've seen a lot of criticisms about the timeline and, you know, Jim Harbaugh was dragging the program through the mud. I mean, Michigan was... Michigan was held hostage by the timeline of the NFL hiring cycle. The, everything got pushed back a week because they played, uh, you know, 17 regular season games and that pushed the timeline back a week or so. But um, yeah, it's, I, I it's going to be awkward. It's going to be really awkward in there for a couple of days. I mean, it, it, he can't, Jim cannot just show back up in the building business, like business as usual. There are, there are some sour feelings there. And it, it goes beyond just the idea that he pursued an NFL job. Guys, I mean, I, I, I stand by the reporting of our site. I stand by some of the national reports out there. Jim Harbaugh got on a plane this week expecting to accept the Vikings job. And for whatever reason, whether he decided to back out of it or whether the Vikings decided this wasn't what they wanted to get themselves into, it's a weird fit anyways. Um He's, he's not doing that. He's coming back to Michigan. And, you know, it's not – he's not coming back with his tail between his legs. He's not that type of guy. I mean, I think it's more um, – it's more likely that he comes back, you know, whenever I think probably sometime today and just sits back down in his office like nothing ever happened. But that can't uh, – that can't be how it moves forward here. I mean, the, the momentum from the last – you know, from what this season was, I mean, for any other program, this is a jumping off point. You, you went to the playoff, you won the Big Ten, you beat Ohio State. And, you know, whether Jim Harbaugh left yesterday or whether he leaves after next year, or whatever it is, he says that this stuff is done. But again, you know, we it, it's, it's tough to say that it is done unless this new deal has some kind of poison pill buyout in it. Um, you know, whether he was to leave now or in the future – the program would have been in a much better place. I know that they were good. There's Michigan was already Michigan was planning to fire up a coaching search as of yesterday. So um, with some good candidates that I think that would have been interested in the job as well. So, you know, if he leaves, yeah, he, he did the job of bringing the program back to where whoever takes it over is, is not the position he was. But I think at the end of the day, stability is, is really what's best for this program right now. And, um, there are going to have to be a lot of a lot of uh, conversations had with some on the coaching staff, some on the team uh, about what just took place, and some transparency about the process and what the intent was. But at the end of the day, I do think this is the best op outcome for Michigan. But it's just the circus. This this is this is how not to capitalize off of a amazing season one hundred and one. It's I can't believe it got to this. Point. Yeah, honestly, the optics of it look so, they just, they don't look right at all. Uh, for me, what it looks like to me is Jim Harbaugh basically said, like, hey, like, I'm going to, we're, we're breaking up. And he went to go cheat, if that's the word. He went, you know, play, fool around, have some fun. And uh, he couldn't get any. So, of course, he, he came back and said, hey, I'm all in. You know what, let's work this out. That That's what it looks like to me. And. Look, I don't think Michigan fans really should be upset. This was the best outcome. I don't think whoever you hired next could have or would have delivered four 10-win seasons in seven years like Harbaugh has. Having said that, though, what's the commitment from Michigan side, Anthony? Like, Harbaugh isn't entertaining offers just because, quote-unquote, he wants to be back in the NFL. Like, NIL is still a problem at Michigan. They're behind in terms of how they recruit. 
and their capabilities really what's what's next in terms of the investment into the football program yeah, to me, I mean, it goes beyond just paying your head coach. I think there are administrative things that Michigan needs to work out. And quite frankly, you know, like NIL, like the transfer portal, um, Michigan has been very reactive to all of these things. They have not been very proactive, which I think reactive and getting out in front of or proactive and, and getting out in front of these things. Those are the programs that are, you know, are set up for this. And I, I think with the brand power that Michigan has, I don't think the NIL should be an issue. It seems like they're slowly chipping away at that, but um, you know the transfer portal thing's tough because you know Michigan's admissions policy. If you, it's it's a lot easier to get in either as a freshman or a graduate. If you're a freshman and you've just taken the basic prerequisite courses that transfer over, you're good. Uh, but those those fr- those sophomores, juniors, it's tough to get into Michigan because not a lot of your stuff transfers. And you know, a guy like Shea Patterson, for example. Um, when he came to Michigan, I think he had to give up 17 to 20 credits or something like that just to get into the university. Um, and he's still taking classes there to um, to knock some of that stuff out. So it's tough. And I don't I don't see Michigan overhauling its admissions policy for the transfer portal. And that makes it a little more difficult. But, you know, NIL is something they can control. How the staff recruits is something they can control. Um, you know, going back to how Harbaugh factors into that, I mean, um, I don't see this having any effects on the current roster. I don't see it having any effects on the 2022 recruiting class that they just signed, which, you know, I know a lot was made about this going down on national signing day. Michigan's class was done. It was over with. They signed all of their guys, um, in December. There's one guy still lingering out there, but it, it was a slim chance he was going to come to Michigan anyway. So I, the optics of it are terrible. Don't get me wrong. I'm not absolving anyone of that can't believe I really can't believe Jim Harbaugh and Michigan let it get to that point um but the the staff was you know I think the staff kind of was given some scheduled off time anyway so there's that too but yeah they're gonna have some questions to answer about this uh, especially in this 2023 class that they're getting going now I mean um you know guys on our site EJ Holland and Tim uh, Verghese who are recruiting writers felt that there was a shot Michigan could have put a top three four class together in this cycle and maybe they still can um, but this was such a, uh, choose my words carefully here. This was such a, an outrageous turn of events for Michigan and the optics of it are very bad. They, whatever, when they sit down and, and hash this out and, and, you know, move plow forward here, they just, it has to come with, we can't do the song and dance again. Um, the last two years have been ripe with with instability and questions about the head coach. Last year was for a two and four season. That, quite frankly, you know, people will deba- debate the merits of what the contract was that Michigan gave him. He was paid for what what he had done, and he had a chance to earn it all back. He did. Um, this year it was. I don't know if there were hurt feelings over that. I don't know what the deal was scratching that itch of wanting to get back to the NFL, which is legitimate, um, but. Yeah, it's I there is not enough Excedrin, there is not enough migraine uh stuff in the world for for the Michigan media right now. I mean this was this was quite a saga and like I said, um anyone who says that it was a last second change of heart from Harbaugh, that might be true, but he got on the plane to Minnesota to with the intent of taking the job. So I don't know how you come back from that. I would love to be a fly on the wall uh, in Schembechler Hall this week, but I think that everything will ultimately be smoothed over and uh, we'll see what happens from there. Yeah, I've been reaching out heavily on social media, trying to get in touch with any Minnesota local reporter, anybody involved with the team, trying to just get some more information. But from what I understand, Anthony, They did the same thing with Patrick Graham. They had him fly out, meet in person, and Patrick Graham, mind everybody at home, the defensive coordinator for the New York Giants, young prospect, uh, definitely has a future in the NFL, but they've done all this before. And I think whether it was miscommunication, I'm not sure, but you kind of said it. Harbaugh expected to be offered the job on Wednesday, and I think that's why the report came out that Harbaugh is expected to take the Minnesota job because I think the expectation was they would offer it to him 
given he was flying out on Wednesday. Does that make, is, are, are we on the same page here? On the same page. That's my understanding. That's, that's our understanding of what it was. I mean, there were, there were people close to Jim Harbaugh saying the same things that he, they expected him to take the job if offered. And even some of the, you know, dissenting, I won't say dissenting media reports aside from what the Wolverine reported, but even everyone else was saying it's 80, 20 or, or 85, 15, that he's gone, that if offered, he's out of here. Um, so I think everyone is mostly on the same page with it. So this can't be, a, you know, this was a place for me all of long speech or this can't, you know, he went there, he went there with every intent to get back to the NFL. And I think, um, I'm not sure what led him to believe that, you know, my understanding of the call over the weekend that was just kind of, you know, Hey, get to know you. Let's wrap a little bit about, about what this, this opportunity could look like. And you, we'd love you to come out and interview just like everyone else. Somehow wires got crossed there. I will say this. I mean, well, far from an insider, uh, I did cover the Vikings for the, for I believe three and a half years uh, where I was before. And, like I said, it's a good organization. I think their ownership is is tremendous. They have new facilities, practice facility, new stadium. Um, but it's it's I don't know if that type the the type of organization they run, which is again, um, I think they do things pretty well over there. Um, I just I don't know if that's that was a fit for Jim. Um, and some people believe that a lot of this has to do with. You know, Jed York somewhat like blackballing him from the NFL, and that's maybe why there has been a push, such a push to get back, back there just to prove he can. But um, he didn't, and he's coming back. And like I said, um, it's it's just it's a wild situation, and that adds to the um, the circus that has been the Jim Harbaugh experience over the last you know seven years or so. Well, Anthony, uh, honestly, I couldn't agree more. And I, I think, again, it's really important for people to understand the journalistic, the, the journalistic aspect of this and just the optics of it. It's not that these were rumors. No, no. Th this is what was being communicated behind the scenes, and it's just being reported, just like the Schefter-Brady retirement. It was true. There was a lot of truth to it. Was it official? No. But there was a lot of truth to it, and there was so much truth. And the fact that Harbaugh was actually going to leave and that he was actually going to take the Minnesota job if offered. I think the last second turn of events simply was they didn't offer him the job. And whether he didn't expect it, Michigan didn't, I'm not sure. But Anthony, I, I really can't thank you enough for coming on this morning. I uh, would love to have you back sometime soon. Um, stay, stay warm and stay safe in this weather, man. <laughs> I will do my best. I always have time for you guys. Thank you so much for having me today. Appreciate it, Anthony. Take care, man. Appreciate you. Oh, Fish giving a round of applause. Fish is such a gentleman, by the way. I want to kill him sometimes. Yeah, I know. You know? It's just that relationship you sometimes. have with somebody. Sometimes? You mean all the time? No, I'm. you said it, not me. <laughs> 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 all right, Maddie, we got to go to break. When we get back, me and Jeff got to talk about a good friend of ours. And that friend is Ben Johnson. Ben Johnson, me and Jeff, what, three months ago, Jeff? Four months ago? Oh, yeah. We brought up the idea that maybe this is the guy that should be the OC. It's starting to heat up. So we'll get to Ben Johnson next. And after that, should the Detroit Lions pursue Malik Willis? We got a lot of stuff coming up. I'm excited. We do have a lot of stuff coming up, but we also need to hear about Gypsy Vodka. Before Ooh, Gypsy break. Vodka is the smoothest tasting vodka on the market. Guys, locally owned and operated up in Petoskey, Michigan, Gypsy Vodka is where your drinking habits need to start. Gypsy is gluten-free, and again, whenever you stop by any convenience store, liquor store, etc., ask for it by the name of Gypsy. And please, as always, drink responsibly. Hi, my diamonds. It's Crystal with an X. You want to get hot and perfect like me? Here's my super easy routine. <laughs> drink at least a gallon of water before you wake up. <laughs> Attach a weight to everything in your house. Hello? Sell your car and just sprint everywhere. <laughs> Scream when you exhale. Yeah! Don't follow Crystal with an X. Do your own thing at Planet Fitness with tons of equipment and free fitness training in our clean and spacious clubs. Join now for just $10 a month and cancel anytime. What's the over-under? Should I tease? 
Yes. Who is the lock of the night? Make sure you're watching Woodward Bets to get the latest in sports betting and more. Woodward Bets, daily on Woodward Sports. Welcome back. Thanks for tuning in here on the Morning Woodward Show on the Woodward Sports Network. Guys, Lions tight end coach Ben Johnson now in the mix for the offensive coordinator position. Jack, what do you think? Oh, uh, I... I uh... Oh, I could not be even more elated. I mean, we talked about this months ago, like you mentioned, and the first time we had this discussion, Adam, is, is when he started becoming the pass game coordinator and you saw the improvement of Jared Goff. And over the last stretch of games, he started over the season, looked like a, suit, a decent quarterback with Amon Ross St. Brown making that explosion. Obviously, no T.J. Hawkinson. He was missing still guys on the offense. Um, similar case to Aaron Glenn on the defense, but the difference was Dan Campbell was doing the play calling. So with Ben Johnson... Let's uh, let's just talk about Ben Johnson from an OC point of view. And obviously, he's innovative. We know this. Players love him. Amon Rod's talked about him. Jared Goff's talked about him. And even at the Senior Bowl, getting a chance to, to really trial at OC and, and getting praise from the quarterbacks. Malik Willis, high on him. And talking about Ben Johnson and how well of a communicator he is and teacher. Even at, you know, high 30s, mid 30s, uh, he's, he's really intelligent about the game of football. And that's someone that you look for for OC, especially nowadays. I mean, this is where the league's trending. I and mean, then Ben Johnson did a great job in the past game late in the year, um, installing his philosophy uh, and, and kind of having Dan Campbell call plays. And I think that's a great combination. Uh, it worked towards the end of the season. Dan Campbell was in more control over what was happening. And now, do I want Ben calling plays? I think that's a different discussion because we saw Dan call plays and have success towards the end of the season. I would say I would love Ben to be the OC. And you could talk about who's the play caller. That's a different discussion. Dan can still have those duties. But in terms of creating the offense, I mean, we saw what he did in the past game. Deuce did in the run game. It's probably going to be more of a collaborative effort again, but you need a guy to have the title. So if we're talking who's going to have the title of the OC and who we vouch for, to me, it's got to be Ben Johnson because – We've always made this point, Adam. Why go out and get somebody like a Matt Nagy? I know that was floating around to install their philosophy when you already have one that works, one that players are familiar with. Last year, towards the end of the year, the, the, obviously the, the wins started adding up more and more, but still didn't didn't win a whole lot of games. But this year, guys are going to be healthy. You're going to have Frank Ragnow. You're going to have hopefully another wide receiver uh, in the draft somehow, and you're going to have more guys coming to this team. So with Ben Johnson, I think there's a lot of upside there. Uh, Dan's familiar with him. Obviously, he's worked, he worked with him back in Miami. And I've always said this. Ben is familiar. He's coached pretty much every player on off. He's coached wide receivers. He's coached tight ends. He's coached quarterbacks. He's familiar. Now he's a, he's a pass game coordinator. So I think he's, he's put in the time, and he's someone that needs to be looked at. And, and he's giving, obviously getting interviews this week with Dan Campbell and, and Brad Holmes. So if he doesn't get the job, I'll be surprised. Obviously, you talk about Deuce Staley. I think Deuce... In my opinion, he deserves to be a head coach one day, no doubt. Uh, but if I'm just talking strictly off the results I saw from when Ben took over that pass game, man, it, it was special. And this is where they improved the most. They were the worst early in the year in their pass game. It was obviously Jared Goff didn't look too good. They were able to run the ball, obviously. He had an offensive line. But as the season improved uh, and you started seeing those, those improvements, I got to give Ben Johnson more credit. So I, I think I'm going to say it. I'm going to keep saying it. Ben Johnson deserves to be the OC. Now Dan Campbell can call plays. I think that would still work. But you, if you need a guy to get the title at OC, Adam, it's going to be Ben Johnson. I'm going to keep saying it until it, hopefully it happens. Well, I think we both want that to happen. I think what will happen, though, is Deuce Staley likely will get the offensive coordinator title. I think he'll be promoted, and I think it'll be a collaborative effort between himself, Ben Johnson, and obviously Dan Campbell. Jeff, we talked about this a lot. He seems like the young guy in the room that's offering different and different can be good and bad but if you watch the lines especially down the stretch they were different unpredictable they could run the ball and boy did they have some plays up their sleeve that you just weren't ready for using Amon Ross St. Brown really similar to how you saw San Francisco use Debo Samuel out of the backfield in motion in the slot on the edges mm -hmm. like that that, to me, is, is extremely encouraging. Now, whether or not he gets the title or Deuce Staley, honestly, I'm not even interested in what at this point because I know at the end of the day, even if they don't announce an OC, 
It'll be a three-man crew. Ben Johnson, Deuce Daly, likely, and Dan Campbell, with Dan Campbell probably having full autonomy at the end of the day on all decisions. So, Jeff, I, I really don't have a problem with it. I, I think it's Deuce, though. I really do. I think it's Deuce Daly. Look, this is a guy they brought. They want to get his name higher in the ranks. It's, it's kind of too obvious of an effort. I don't see how it's been realistically, even though that's maybe what we want. But I think it's Deuce Staley. What do you think? Honestly, you're probably right. And with Deuce Staley, obviously, they talk about him in Philadelphia. He was assistant coach for, for, for a long time, running backs coach. He never got an interview or with the Philadelphia Eagles. They never considered him for the head coaching job. And a lot of people felt offended of that. I mean, Deuce Staley is a hell of a coach. And obviously, in this league, to get those opportunities, especially as a minority, you've got to be a uh, number one a coordinator. Uh, he's an assistant coach, hell of an assistant coach. But like you said, to really get out there and, and advertise yourself, if he's OC, he's going to get interviews. I mean, you see it all around the league, um, depend, depending on how well of a job he does, of course. But if that's the route Deuce is wanting to take, and that's where Dan sees him going, is getting those head coaching interviews, it's clear it's going to be at that offensive coordinator role. Um, with Ben Johnson, I wouldn't have a problem if he stayed at the pass game coordinator, as long as he has a, a touch in this offense, which we both assume he will. I'm okay with it. I just think at the end of the day, Deuce Staley, he deserves to be a head coach more than Ben Johnson. So in that case, I'm not going to argue with it. I think he's, he's good enough. But it, like you said, it's going to be a three-man crew at the end of the day. So whoever gets the OC job, it's probably irrelevant. Yeah, and again, you know, this is one of the awkward things that we have to talk about. Because who's, who else is going to talk about it if we don't? Mm -hmm. How involved is Deuce Staley in the offense? Is he just getting the title because Dan Campbell's trying to take care, take care of his own people? Wasn't well, that the same practice we accuse everybody of doing in the NFL? Taking care of their guys, their their buddies they want to promote? Like, I don't have a problem with it. But if Deuce Staley's the OC, I expect him to execute like an offensive coordinator. I don't expect him to be just behind the scenes and given the title and, like, the credit, but he's just part of three people actually doing it. I, I don't know how I feel about that, Jeff. It, the optics just look so weird. And can I ask you this question, too? If you have Dan Campbell calling plays, Deuce would be essentially, you know, maybe a run game coordinator. He'd help out. It'd be kind of a Ben Johnson and Deuce Daly collaborative effort with, with Dan. Because if, if Dan's calling plays, what would Deuce's job be exactly? Just helping That's out, a I great question. That's that, and that is that is the that is the optics I look at and I don't like. It doesn't look right to me, and I can kind of see behind it. And you know me, Jeff. I've been up here for almost two months now, saying Dan Campbell should be calling plays in 2022. Whether you guys want to say it how I say it or not, I don't care. But the truth is, the Anthony Lynn hire was a failure. So he's 0 for one in terms of hiring OCs. And I believe strongly, if I'm Dan Campbell, I'm calling plays next year. I know what I want. I know how I want the games to go. I want to be able to control how my team plays moving forward because my job is on the line. If he invests a new coordinating role into a Deuce Staley or a Ben Johnson and it doesn't work out, well, guys, that's going to be 0 for 2. And that's not a good look either. And if that doesn't work out, that means the offense isn't working out, which means the team probably isn't going to be that very uh, all that good. So you have to think about these teams. I, uh, or excuse me, you have to think about these things. Dan Campbell, I think, should be the play caller in 2022. I don't think anybody else should be calling plays. If you want to give Deuce the title, fine. But I'm just saying, I'm looking out for the best interest of Deuce Daly. You having a title and not calling the plays seems pretty pointless to me. Look at the Eric Bieniemy situation. He calls the plays, but people still accuse that entire, you know, coaching, oh, it's, it's Andy Reid. And he's calling the plays in, since, uh, or in Kansas City, excuse me. So, yeah, I think the optics look really bad for Deuce Daly if he does decide to accept an OC position where he's not even calling plays. Jeff, what do you think? No, I, I completely agree. And the tough thing I have to imagine is if, if he's not calling plays and he goes to that OC role, and you're obviously expecting him at that point, if you're OC over the next couple of years, you'd get looked at, uh, obviously, if he's doing a good job. If Dan's calling plays, though, how does that benefit Deuce Staley in terms of getting a head coaching job? I don't know, and that's title. what pisses me right. off. Is is it a title game? So we're just giving people titles in hopes that they get a job, or are we talking about qualified candidates now again? Ben Johnson, I think, is the clear favorite and the most qualified in that room to take over the OC position, clearly. And that's not just my point of view. 
I believe that is the general consensus internally. You can look at what the beat reporters have been reporting all season. Ben Johnson is somebody everybody in that building looks up to. You can even look now at the Senior Bowl. He's an educator. He knows how to communicate. He's very well standing up in front of people. He knows how to talk in front of people. He understands how to teach and educate people on what exactly they're trying to do. That's, that's, those are really good qualities, if you ask me. Mm -hmm. I think it should be Ben Johnson, but again, if we're giving people titles just to help them advance, look, I can see right past that. And if I can see past that sitting here on a mic, I'm pretty sure a guy who's sitting in a front office at a GM position can see past it, especially given their connections and their ability to get information and their ability to dive in to any situation around the league and get, I would say, good, good sourcing on it. So, look, I think Ben Johnson's the play. Deuce Staley right now, I believe, is the head coach for the Senior yes, Bowl. Yes, yes. So, look, yeah. I, I, I get it. You know, and people may feel he got a raw deal when Doug Peterson was hired. Well, how'd that work out? And then they, got, they feel like he got a raw deal when Sirianni got hired. Well, how'd that work out? And again, you won't know if Deuce Staley will be a good head coach until you give him the opportunity. But if there's somebody that doesn't, like, I'm just going to try to break it down as simple as this. If I'm a GM and I have an interview and I interview 10 candidates and there are three I like, but I'm not sure of, three that I like that I'm sure of, and the remaining four are proven. I'm probably going to go in the middle with the guys that I like and that I think have a higher upside. I'm not going to go with the guys that I think I like, but I'm not sure. And I'm not going to go with the proven guy because I likely know what he already is. And he wouldn't be on the open market if he was something special. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Who knows? Maybe I'm totally, totally ignorant in how I'm thinking right now. Who knows? But I'm sorry. Deuce Daly, you want the job? Announce him as the OC he calls plays because he's not going to get a head coaching job just sitting there being the OC as a title. And Dan Campbell's yeah. calling plays. It's such a bad look. It really is. For his sake. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Maddie, we got to go to break. When do we get back? What is next? Or excuse me, should the Detroit Lions pursue Malik Willis at quarterback Ooh. in the first round? Guys, there are some hot reports coming out of Mobile, Alabama right now. Looks like the Lions are falling in love with Malik Willis. We'll talk about that next, Maddie. We will talk about that next, but first we have to talk about my bookie. All right, my bookie, the place to bet this weekend. Whether you want to bet basketball, hockey, does it matter, or you want to wait till next week when the Super Bowl comes out, guys, take advantage of their dollar for dollar offer. Sign up today using code Woodward. They'll match your dollar, or excuse me, they'll match your offer. And your first deposit, dollar for dollar. You put in $100, they'll match you $100. You put in $200, they'll match you with $200. But from anywhere, anytime, using my bookie. And again, use code Woodward when you sign up. If you have a gambling problem, call 1 800 270 7117. Fellows, football season is here. It's time to make your grooming experience easy like Sunday morning. Get to Lady Jane's Haircuts for Men. Walk in, relax, watch your favorite team play, and before you know it, your hair will be game ready. Get to Lady Jane's, open 10 to 8, 7 days a week. Walk in anytime. It's wicked awesome. Here at Woodward Sports, we're always up for a good cause and a good time. This year, we present the 2022 Cuba Zani Run. <laughs> Yeah, you heard right. Time to get in our underwear and run the streets of Detroit. For the last 12 years, we've stripped down, ran in the cold, and partied to raise money to help fund research to end NF. February 12th, join the staff from Woodward Sports and hundreds of other beautiful people. Downtown at the Tin Roof. You can register as an individual or your team today at woodwardsports.com. So start doing those squats, sit-ups, or just some 12-ounce curls. And get ready for Cupid's Undy Run 2022. Sponsored by the awesome people at Gypsy Vodka, Cintron, and Planet Fitness. We'll see you February 12th at the Tin Roof. In our underwear. Start your new year with a new network. Woodward Sports Network is here. Welcome back. Thanks for tuning in here on the Morning Woodward Show on the Woodward Sports Network. 
Also featured on the Roar on 99.1, 93.5, and 94.7 HD2. Guys, Adam is dying out here. He has not had coffee today. This is day one. No coffee. Don, He's I'm a man of my great. word. Oh, jeez. Alex, if you want to move down the camera just a little bit so he sees that there's nothing, there's no caffeine on this desk. There is no caffeine. Can I warn nothing. you this could be like five months or a year? Just just want to let you know. I've accepted that reality. Okay. Well, I, I just didn't know if you thought it through fully. Look at this. Look at this. Bring it down. Bring it down. Bring it down. <laughs> For those who didn't know, Adam screamed during the break. And I looked at yeah. him and I was like, what's wrong with you? I was like, oh, my God, you didn't have coffee. <laughs> yeah, no caffeine. Look at this, Don. Nothing. Nothing in this vicinity. Leave me the hell alone this morning. You've already made my life hell. All right? I hope you're happy. But anyways, we got to talk about the Detroit Lions and Malik Willis. Jeff, oh, God. what the hell is going on? Well, it's, it seems the Lions are falling in love with Malik Willis. And obviously, we, we understood out of all the senior, all the quarterbacks at the Senior Bowl, Malik Willis clearly um, the most, I would say, talented. Because you got to see uh, guys like 4-3-7 speed, has a cannon of an arm, obviously can throw farther than any of the quarterbacks at, the, at the, uh, the Senior Bowl. The problem I have, and we've talked about this before, and we've constantly had this discussion, is his accuracy. And they brought that up at the Senior Bowl as well. Um, he's obviously he's had a, he had a great day yesterday in the rain, uh, but at the same time, there's questions I have with Malik Willis. He is a project, but I, I'm not, and listen, I will always stand by this. I'm not a project guy unless it's a Trey Lance. Like there's certain individuals you look at and you say, all right, that's a project, and that that's a project that if it, if it works out, and I have confidence it will work out. With Malik Willis to really use that second first round pick on him. You, you have to be sure that Malik Willis not only will translate to the NFL, which we see his speed and obviously he's got the arm. My question is in college, um, accuracy was always an issue. He, he never, he had an average of 60% completion percentage just over um, in college. And listen, that's, that's okay. That's, that's great. But in the NFL, you're going to need to hit guys. You're going to need to be 65% completion percentage. You need, you're going to need to be accurate. And with Malik Willis, you're going to need to build an offense around him because look at what Lamar Jackson, everyone thinks everyone likes to compare to Lamar Jackson. Well, Lamar Jackson went to Baltimore Ravens. They brought in Greg Roman and they built that entire offense around him and it worked. It, it worked. And Lamar Jackson, talented player, MVP second year. It, that's an anomaly. That's an anomaly. I think, you know, it is a copycat league and, and you know, GMs and front offices fall in love with those types well, of Jeff, players. Do you, you, do you think he's going to be available at 31, 32? No, because I don't. No. So no, if they're making a move for Malik Willis, it's either at number two or they're trading up. Yeah. I, and I can that's see, the reality I, I think people need to start really expecting. Mm -hmm. I could see teams probably re getting them in around 20s or even even high teens. I would not be surprised. I don't think Malik goes two or five or even top ten. Listen, if he does, good luck uh, to those teams that take him. I'm not saying he's bad, but top ten, I don't think he's worth that high of a pick. Um, I could see, you know, high teens at 20s, and if he does go that high, then that's fine with me. I'm perfectly okay with it. Sam Howell is another guy I was looking at, but no doubt in my mind, Ed, I'm not going to argue with anybody. Malik Willis has had a great, great couple days at the Senior Bowl, but I don't – I just hope that doesn't make people fall in love with him enough to where you want to trade up for him and grab him because – Yeah, look, I mean, if we're, giving, if we're giving personal opinions, Jeff, I, I'm not a fan. Not a fan. Great arm talent. Won't deny it. Rocket arm. Mm -hmm. I am okay with Jared Goff for the next two seasons. I am not in a rush to get a quarterback. I have a stable bridge quarterback. I think this football team can win seven, eight, nine games this season. Load up defensively. And you can figure out the quarterback position in the next two years. Now, yes, you do have the number two overall pick. Excuse me, this is not the Joe Burrow class. This is not the Justin Herbert class. You, you missed on those opportunities. This year, none of them exist. Or at least we don't believe they do. And if we don't believe they do right now, it's tough for you to sell a quarterback at number two, let alone trading up to 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, whatever it may be, just to get Malik Willis who again will be likely a project player. But I have to bring up something that was brought to my attention during an interview a few weeks back. Guys, do you know who is a part of the Detroit Lions front office? Jeff, you want to take a wild guess? 
Uh, you could you could say it for me. Oh, I don't know where on, you're going on. with this. I don't All know right. where you're going with this. Are you talking about just who's a GM or who's John who's John Dorsey? John Dorsey. Oh yeah, John Dorsey. Yes. Who was yes. the same guy that stood in front of all of the Kansas City media and defended the Patrick Mahomes pick? Mm -hmm. And am I more comfortable and confident with him in the room if they reach up and get a quarterback? Yes, I am. I would be a little more confident than usual. Having said that, boy, if you spend a number two pick or you're going to have to give up probably a second and who knows what to trade back up to get into the first round from 32 all the way up to 14, 16, 18, who knows? Oof. I mean, I, I tell you guys this all the time, and I hope you take this seriously. When you're a GM, you have two jobs. Get the quarterback right, get the head coach right. When you're a head coach, your job, get the quarterback right, make sure the team wins games. It's that simple. Yeah. And if you can't do that, and then you finally draft a quarterback, you get one shot at drafting a quarterback. Very few GMs get multiple chances. Very few. We saw it work out in Arizona, but they got the number one overall pick next year. Threw it all away. Josh Rosen, coach, goodbye. Kingsbury, Murray, and end of story. That rarely happens. You mm -hmm. rarely get the second opportunity to go after a quarterback. So you got to be very careful. And honestly, I think Brad Holmes likes Jared Goff. I think, I think he can... I think he thinks that he can win with Jared Goff. And I think Dan Campbell thinks he can win with Jared Goff. And we saw it down the stretch, 3-1 and one in his last four games. You can call them meaningless games. You can say whatever you want. Down the stretch, the team looked a lot better. They looked like a competent football team. The offense was much better. And the defense was completely riddled with injuries, and they still showed up. Yep. You cannot take that away from this football team. So Jeff, and, and let me let me ask ahead, you this real quick, Adam. Too with Jared Goff, we understand Jared Goff went through a lot this year, a lot of adversity, especially with the team around him, all the injuries. Who in the right mind expects Malik Willis? And now I hear the Pittsburgh rumors. And now if he goes to Pittsburgh, any quarterback, you're going to look different in Pittsburgh compared to uh, in the Detroit Lions at this point in time. So if he sits a year, let's say he sits a year behind Jared Goff, he comes back next year. Are we that much of an improved situation to where no. you have an offensive line? Exactly. There you go. No. And you're not starting him over Jared Goff. Yeah. Sorry. Guys, Jared Goff, good quarterback. Middle of the pack. Average. Good. Whatever you want to call it. I don't care. Are you bringing in a rookie that's going to take that job year one? Likely not. That's a project. All right, fine. He sits a year. If it is Malik Willis, what kind of offense do you have to run to set him up for success pittsburgh likely trading for jimmy garoppolo who knows maybe denver trades for jimmy garoppolo we don't know but teams there's three teams that are going to draft a quarterback in the with the first 11 picks guarantee it it will happen quarterback driven league the quarterback position is the most overvalued position because of its value. And when I say overvalued, it's not meaning it's not a valuable position. What I mean by that is teams are willing to do whatever it takes to draft the guy if they believe he's there. And if Brad Holmes, John Dorsey, and company believe that this is the guy for Detroit, fine. But if you just ask my opinion this morning, February 3rd, 2022, load up on defense. You have an opportunity, whether it's an edge rusher, with that first pick, to grab a linebacker with the second pick, to grab a safety, a wide receiver, an edge rusher in the third round, a linebacker in the fourth round. You have the opportunity to do so. Load up on defense. That would be my recommendation. Again, if they fall in love with the quarterback, they have to go all in on it. I will support it, even if I don't like it. Why? Because that means I can now evaluate Brad Holmes. He went all in on this quarterback. If this quarterback does not succeed... I can hold these people accountable. I have no problem with them taking a quarterback. But damn, I'm not sure it's the year. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we're all wrong. Who knows? But I don't think it's this year, Maddie. Yeah, I don't think it's this year either. Um, we do have to go to break, though. So when we come back, we're going to be talking about who has more to prove, Michigan or Michigan State? But first, can you please tell me about Planet Fitness? Ooh, Planet Fitness, home of the judgment-free zone. And not only home of the judgment-free zone, but now the judgment-free studio. Planet Fitness, the new 
studio sponsor of the Woodward Sports Network. So happy to have them part of the family. Guys, your fitness is essential in 2022 and always really moving forward. Sign up for Planet Fitness today. Zero down, $10 a month. Take your mental and physical health seriously. Guys, again, zero down, $10 a month. That's Planet Fitness. Again, your fitness is essential. It took exploring 50 different formulas and hosting countless taste tests, but we believe Gypsy Vodka is the smoothest vodka on the market. Don't believe us? Ask the owners. We're Mike and Adam Kazanowski with High Five Spirits Distillery. We're in close to about 1,200 locations throughout Michigan. We wanted to create a brand that was geared more towards freedom, love, adventure, and at the end of the day, we really wanted to tell a story that inspired other people to take risk, follow their dreams, whatever that might be. Follow us everywhere. Just search Woodward Sports on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, IG, and more. More, 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 more. Chili Peppers Tanning. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, is where you'll find the cleanest salons in the Detroit area. With spotless, sanitized rooms and trained, certified tanning professionals, join the Pepper Club. For all the best deals, they'll be all the competitors you have by $5. That's Chili Peppers Tanning Salon. Guys, check them out. Visit ChiliPeppersTanning.com. Again, that's ChiliPeppersTanning.com. Maddie. I know, I know you're I know you're a central <laughs> girl, but I, I can kind of feel the state vibes. Yes. All right. So <laughs> definitely a Michigan State football supporter, right? Sure. I can read the room correctly. You can read the room. All right. So we're going to talk about which <laughs> program has more to prove in 2022. Michigan or Michigan State. And I don't care whether it was Harbaugh there next year or somebody else. It didn't really matter for me. My answer wasn't changing. It was always going to be Michigan. Why? Because Michigan State have given me something I am clamoring for, for the University of Michigan, which is an investment, a long-term, big-picture investment into the program. I have not seen that yet with Michigan. And again, Michigan, you have Harbaugh next year. You better start J.J. McCarthy next year, or I will literally drive up to Ann Arbor and burn the whole damn place down. But anyways, we'll, we'll forget about that for a second. Which program has more to prove? It's Michigan. Was this year a farce? And honestly, I expect them to lose by 40 to Ohio State this year. I just do. Maybe that's my way too early predictions, but I'm sorry. C.J. Stroud, Smith & Jimba, Marvin Harrison Jr., my God, Ohio State, you recruit at an exceptional level. Unbelievable. I think Michigan has more to prove. Mel Tucker winning the Peach Bowl. 11 wins. Just in year, basically two. Because he had half, a, not even half a season. His first full year, they win 11 games. I mean, this is really, this is essentially year two for him. G give me, give me Michigan. They got more to prove. Michigan State are on the right track. I'm confident about where they're going. So I'm not putting them in a position where they have to do something. And I'm not even expecting Michigan to win the Big Ten next year. But I expect just some little things that really matter to me. Optics. J.J. McCarthy's a starter. You beat Michigan State this year. And you, you go for 10 wins. You got to win 10 games this year. Mm. That's, my, that, that's my thought on Michigan. Jeff? Adam, you absolutely nailed it. You did. And I, I was I, for a second, I don't know why, but I felt like you were going to go Michigan State, but I'm so happy. And you nailed it because Michigan State, 11 wins, like you said, and essentially year, really year two, um, coming out. If obviously the COVID year won a couple games, but this is his first year and he did a hell of a job, hell of a job with Kenneth Walker and all those guys, Peyton Thorne. Um, now he's already gotten a head start in recruiting. And I think Mel's fine. I, I, listen, there's expectations definitely with Michigan State. But who has more to prove? It's Michigan. And that might have to be a little bit with the storylines this year. But it's more so, like you said, J.J. McCarthy. Can Jim succeed in this new era recruiting with the NIL? You got Blake Corum, Donovan Edwards. You landed all those guys. But how do you follow up? You won the Big Ten last year. I don't think they win it this year. We both agree. They probably lose to Ohio State. But my question is, can you beat Michigan State? Just beat Michigan State. That's the, that's really the more to prove. Um, you have J.J. McCarthy returning. Now you lost a job Owen Hutchinson. But – the question to me is, the, the whole question, who has more to prove, is there a next level to this Michigan program? And, and can you finally beat Michigan State? I'm, I'm not talking this year, but in the future. 
Um, you have J.J. at quarterback, obviously, but there's much more that needs to be added to this team um, to get back to where they were last year, You know, having a chance to even match up against Georgia in the playoffs. So with Michigan State, they're on their way, and I think that's where the question gets answered. They have proved it already with Mel Tucker. They won the Peach Bowl, like you said. Um, they came short. They lost to Ohio State by a lot. But at the end of the day, what else did anybody expect? Who cares? I, mean, I, I don't care because they over-exceeded all there expectations year two. There you go. Yeah. I'm not even interested. By year four, I will be one of the, the – I, I can guarantee you, two years from now, my stance on Michigan State will be completely different. you got to win 10 games got to beat ohio state you got to do this i mel tucker's in year two yeah harbaugh's going into year eight totally different situations guys come on please and if i'm being honest here i think michigan has to do i think both teams have to do this was last year a fluke right both teams want to avoid going six seven eight wins you don't want that coming off an 11 and 12 win season so what does michigan need to do they need to play super aggressive High tempo football. You're not going to be able to ground and pound, ground and pound like you did this year. I'm sorry. The O-line isn't the same. The defensive line isn't the same. J.J. McCarthy will likely be the starting quarterback. He better be the starting quarterback if you really yeah. want to have a chance. And that's just my two cents. Look, you guys can laugh at me all you want about my thoughts on K uh, Cade McNamara. But boy, boy, when it matters most, fourth quarter against MSU. Boy, when it matters most, game against Georgia, nowhere to be found. That is the point. He has a ceiling. I'm not saying you can't win. If Cade is the starter next year, I say Michigan wins nine games, minimum. Book him for nine wins. You think with that team around him? You, you Eight think home with that games, they him? win nine games, 100%. J.J. Okay. McCarthy, though, I think he can get you to a repeat of a Big Ten title. I think he can win you a national title. I think he's that good. Maybe I think too much of J.J. McCarthy. Who knows? But I know what Cade McNamara is and sure as hell know what he isn't. Mm -hmm. So you tell me, you guys want to compare him to Stenson Bennett? Stenson Bennett threw over 30 touchdown passes for Georgia last year. What did yeah. Cade have? 15? Oh, well, he didn't turn the ball over, Adam. Yay. <laughs> Great. Those are the standards now. Jeff? Yeah. I, I better see J.J. McCarthy starting for Michigan. I'm not sure what I'll do. I may kill you, honestly. <laughs> I do no, want to throw I, this we, in here real quick, too. Sorry, Jeff. Um, no, you're fine. Do we think that everything that's happened with Harbaugh has any emphasis on whether they have more to prove this year? Uh, no, I, I didn't think it really mattered whether he stayed or left. He has nothing to prove to that program. You know why? Because they know nothing about football. <laughs> they don't. They know nothing. Yeah. They have zero expectations. And I'm not talking about their fans. Please, I'm not criticizing their fans here. I'm talking about your, your boosters and your executives at the top level in Ann Arbor. Mm -hmm. Where is their commitment and their investment into Michigan football? We talked about NIL earlier with Anthony Broom, and it's a very important subject to talk about. When are you going to commit to being better than Ohio State, to being better than an SEC school? And the point is, right now, you're not committed. And I could argue you may not beat Ohio State for another 10 years if you want to stay along this path. Ground and pound, uh, ground and pound, north and south football. Like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Like, it, it's got to change. you got to open up your ability to bring in recruits, different kind of recruits, different kind of players. The defense looks mm -hmm. nice. You just lost Mike <clears throat> McDonald. That's a and problem. good players. That's a problem. You lost a hell of a lot. You're going to lose, what, five, six players to the draft, likely. Mm -hmm. Oof, Michigan, you got a lot of work to do. But I'm sorry. If J.J. McCarthy is not the starter, Maddie, I may lose my mind. <laughs> Jeff? You're going to lose your mind anyway if you don't get any coffee. <laughs> Yeah, if, if, if J.J.'s not the starter, Adam, we might scrap. We, we honestly might. And that's, that's the thing that doesn't make a lot of sense with this. You have a team that's losing a significant amount of, of talented players. Hassan Haskins probably are losing, like you said, the offensive line, a couple great players on the offensive line. That was a big uh, contributor to that run game. And then you're losing, not to mention, probably a top two, top one maybe, overall pick in Aiden Hutchinson and David Ajabo. So there's things that are going to be lost next year. And, and who to supplement that better? Than a dynamic quarterback and J.J. McCarthy who can use his legs. Like, it's it's the easiest answer. Yeah, you put Cade in there, game manage a team that's missing half the players that did last year, see how that works out. So, uh, like you said, they'll probably win 70 games because of the home games. But if you 
there's a ceiling, and we see the ceiling with with Cade McNamara. I think that's the difference. You don't know JJ McCarthy's ceiling, so if he, if he's not the starter, um, there's going to be some pitch for us. There's going to be some pitch for us. We're, we're going to have an angry mob. Maddie, I do want to ask you, Michigan State, Mel Tucker, what does he have to do this year for you, as a fan? What what do you need to see this year where you just oh yeah like we're taking strides forward I'm feeling good about this we're going to be ready to compete with Ohio State and win the Big Ten in the next two to three years what does that look like um honestly I would just like to see him winning ten games if I'm being honest I don't really have any expectations that they're going to win the Big Ten because I think it's Ohio State's year I've said that every show um, but I I would just like to see them with ten wins I think that's what I I'm good with. All right. I don't mind that. Look, again, even if they don't win, if they win nine games, I, I, it's not the end of the world for me. It really isn't. No. They have to be How, state, right? That's the number one thing. Oof. You think? Like, yeah, look. Oh, 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 we're talking about Michigan? <laughs> Absolutely. Michigan better beat yeah. Michigan State this year. That is a must. You are not losing them, at yes. the big house for a third straight time. You do not fall to 0-3 against Mel Tucker, two of those losses in the big house. Oh, hell no. Hell no. Michigan cannot lose to Michigan State this year. That is one of my supreme locks that I will definitely bet on. I am going mortgage the house, sell my kids. I don't give a shit. All in on Michigan to beat Michigan State this year. There's no chance they go 0-3 against Mel Tucker. That would blow my mind. Willing to bet the house on Jeff. You no, I, I agree with you. I agree with you completely. I, <laughs> I don't see a scenario, even despite not having the talent they did last year. I think we talk about narrative all the time, and and what a better narrative! Like your your possibility to fall 0 and 3 to Michigan State in the Big House. I don't see it happening, and it, it, that starts with JJ McCarthy at quarterback. All right. Well, Maddie, we do need to head to break. When do we get back? We kind of touched on it an early, uh, touched on it a bit earlier, but I want to go more in depth into this because. When does the integrity of the game actually matter? Does it only matter when it's convenient for our, our argument or our narrative? Or is this something we actually care about and we think should never be tampered with? We'll get to that after the break. We'll get to that after the break. But first, we need to talk about the Folling Warehouse. All right, the Folling Warehouse, guys, an amazing, amazing facility. Let me tell you, it has beers. It's got private lanes. Hell, you can open play and play with family and friends all day. Fish, what's up? I put your challenge into the bottom line yesterday. What'd they say? What? They they basically brushed you guys I off know, like you were I scared. know, Maddie. Oh. I know. What? I know. That is so I know. rude. All I right, know. Ryan. I know where you live. So it's not like you can avoid me. I work no, with you. We're going to have to like ambush the Oh, line. ambush? Oh, hell yeah. They, yeah. I'll bring bats tomorrow. Yes. They basically. Because I'm going to be on no coffee. I'm ready. Oh my God. They basically said that everyone wants to play them, and they basically brush you off. All right, you know what? I'm gonna bring my own. I'm gonna bring bowling pins tomorrow. We're just gonna do it in the studio. I'm in. All right. I like no coffee, Adam. He gets he gets a little stinky. You do not like He's no coffee, spicy. Adam. I may get divorced this week or the next few weeks. Who knows? You do no. I am an angry. All right. Anyways, which guys? Let me finish what I'm doing here. The Folding Warehouse in Hamtramck. Check them out. Their website is foldingwarehouse.com. That's foldingwarehouse.com. We'll see you guys right after the break. TikTok, Spotify, Google Play, App Radio. Woodward Sports is everywhere. everywhere. Make sure you follow, like, download, and listen anywhere. Welcome back. Thanks for joining us on the Morning Woodward Show here on the Morning Wo on the Woodward Sports Network. Where are we? We're on the Woodward Sports Network. We're challenging Braylon and Ryan Ermani to fooling. It's gonna happen. We're gonna win. Bring it on. But first, we need to talk about Hugh Jackson. Adam. All right. Well, I kind of brought it up earlier. Jeff, I, I really want your thoughts on this before I get into exactly what's bothering me so much about this Hugh Jackson news. But if Hugh Jackson was compensated for losing, which it sounds like he was, one, what are the implications, Jeff, for the NFL and the Cleveland Browns? And two, what the hell does that say about Hugh Jackson?
Jeff, I can't hear you, buddy. Did you mute yourself? All right, there you go. We're good. You All jackass. Right. So, <laughs> uh, so basically, the, inc inc imp uh, the inc implementations of the of the NFL in terms of you know Jimmy Haslam, you have Stephen Ross. The first case with Brian Flores, now Jimmy Haslam. I think this is going to open the door for a lot more of guys to come forward with their stories. But with this one specifically, Brian Flores, I can understand. And listen, he didn't take the money, and that's what I respect about Brian Flores. He's a coach first. He wants to win games. He said it himself. He owes it to the players. He owes it to his coaching staff, and he was never going to do that. But with Hugh Jackson, and I want to give Hugh Jackson some slack because I don't think that, I think there's been times where Hugh Jackson hasn't gotten a fair shot but after this story comes out and you're, you're, you're finding out now he took that compensation to lose, it's hard for me. Like, listen, this is a guy that was the OC with Andy Dalton, that quarterback, in, in, for the Bengals the year prior to Cleveland. And he did significantly improve that offense. They went to a top seven scoring offense. They made the playoffs. But we're talking about Cleveland. And it doesn't matter what you did prior. It, it matters what happened in Cleveland. And what happened is he didn't win a whole lot of games. And, and I understand he told his story. He said he didn't have any input on the personnel decisions. I get all that. It wasn't fair. But you took compensation. And, and that's where this conversation is going to, Adam. It's, it's a problem. And it, it's hard to argue both sides because you want to take Hugh Jackson's side, obviously. Um, but when you find out he's taking, like you said, we did the numbers earlier, whatever it is, it could be somewhere in the millions uh, for all the compensation. It's it's hard for me to, to really get on Hugh Jackson's side, and, and hopefully there's other stories that don't have this type of uh, situation. Because with Brian Flores, of course, Stephen Ross, if that's the case, he needs to be forced out of the, the NFL in terms of being an owner. Like, that's absolutely ridiculous, and it's inexcusable. But with Cleveland, Jimmy Haslam needs to be looked at, and that needs, case needs to be investigated. But if Hugh Jackson took the money at him, we're going to have a different conversation about Hugh. That's for sure. Well, it sounds like he's admitting to taking the money. And it sounds like a lot of that money was put towards his charity. Like what the hell? <laughs> like well, it it doesn't charity, matter. So it okay. I, I don't. Oh, my. Like, like, I'm really trying to process what's going on with Hugh Jackson. This guy comes out, and I understand, look, he's trying to defend Brian Flores' claims by saying, yes, this happened to me. But, dude, you actually accepted the money. That's the problem. Holy shit. Not Imagine only if he did didn't. You, not only did you accept the money, but you have a 1 in 31 record and you wonder why you don't have a job in the NFL? Mm -hmm. And now it comes out that you actually accepted money to lose games? What the hell do you think players think of you? Mm -hmm. What does that say to your locker room of guys? Who knows? I would love to go back to that 2015 and 2016 team. And I would love to see players on that roster, players selected and drafted, that were cut, traded, waived, who knows, that haven't gotten an opportunity in the NFL since because they played on such a bad football team and they weren't even, to, uh, weren't even able to perform successfully on the football field. How many people's lives did that change? Anybody want to ask that question? Or are we only going to talk about Brian Flores? What the hell am I? I can't believe what's going on here. Like, am I the only one? Like, am I overreacting to this, Maddie? No, no, you're not. Not even a little bit. Am I overreacting to the fact that there's a head coach who accepted money to lose games on purpose that affects everybody in the locker room? Every fan. Like, holy hell, if I'm Cleveland, I am up in arms requesting a refund from every single game I attended in those two years. And not just that, Adam. More importantly, and the problem I see with Hugh Jackson is, it's and I talked about this earlier, it's already hard for minority coaches to get these opportunities. And, and, he, and Hugh Jackson's been one of the guys in the forefront of that, and I, I respect him for that. But when a story like this comes out, it's hard to – because, listen, I, I when Brian Flores first said it about Stephen Ross, I thought it was – obviously it was, it was ridiculous because you look at the fact you're going to pay a minority coach. It doesn't matter who it is, any coach, but specifically a minority coach, to lose games knowing – it's already nearly impossible for these guys to really secure jobs. With you, Jackson, you took the money. So you took the money, and now you're still trying to advocate, well, why, aren't, why don't I have a job? Well, you took money to lose games. So there you go. There's your answer. Brian Flores didn't, and he probably, hopefully, will get an opportunity in the future if the NFL doesn't blackball him. But with you, Jackson, yeah. it's hard for me to defend him. Like, I brought this up yesterday, and, and, that's, and that's what I don't understand about any of this. And, like, how does this affect, affect bookies? If I'm the Detroit Lions, right, and our win total, or if I'm Vegas and I set the win total for the Cleveland Browns that year at five, hey, we're just going to lose every game. 
Yeah. It's cheating. Yeah. That is that that is cheating technically. And who knows? Like how many people were betting on it? Did Hugh Jackson bet on it? Like I have so many questions. <laughs> it's so disgusting. It really is. It really is. Yeah. And I think what kills me the most is yesterday I brought up to you guys that there, I'll give you the list of coaches that if I were a GM before they got hired, before any of them were hired or looked at, who I would approach and I would interview, okay? Jim Harbaugh, Brian Dabble, Patrick Graham, Aaron Glenn, Byron Lefwich, Brian Dabble, Kevin O'Connell. I like Hackett. Nathaniel Hackett. I would interview all of them. There's one more missing off the top of my head. Brian Flores, obviously. Yep. Kellen Moore. I, and I would make a decision. But, like, there's a ton of qualified candidates, and honestly, half of them are black. Why they're not getting the jobs? What do you want me to tell you, huh? I have the right as a GM or an owner to hire who I want. You can't force me to hire anybody. That's the sad truth. Sorry. That's the truth, guys. You can't force me to hire somebody. And that's what we brought up yesterday. It's going to take somebody who really believes in this, a true leader who wants to push for diversity to take a big role in an NFL comp or, or an NFL organization and make those hires. But guys, the Minnesota job and now the Chicago job. Both are African-American GMs. They both have now likely hired white coaches. Mm -hmm. Are we going to scream race there? No. But I think we can see a problem, though. It's okay to identify a problem even if you don't have the solutions for it. I don't have the solutions for any of this. But if you just don't talk about it, that doesn't help anything either. So, yeah, I, I do have a problem with all this, and I do have a problem with Hugh Jackson coming out and actually saying that he took money. Yeah. What a joke. Uh, yeah. Mr. Poole, McDaniels, no, I would not <clears throat> consider Josh McDaniels. Oh, you know who I forgot about, Jeff? Mike McDaniels. I, he would be at the top of my list, by the way. Yeah. yeah. Over every coach I just gave you, Mike McDaniels would be at the top of my list. I am falling in love with him. But I yeah, don't think he'll leave the do. Niners. <laughs> I don't think he'll leave the Niners, at least not yet. But Mike McDaniels is the guy I'm in love with. So, again, is that bad of me? That I predetermined know who I want, Mike McDaniels in a free market? Does that make me somebody who is, you know, not giving equal opportunity? Even though, like, I just took the GM job, I know the, the guy I want to bring in. Yep. But I just gave you all the guys I would interview, though, because I think the world of them. I think they actually offer something different. But what happens when you do have that preconceived, this is my guy? Well, there's nothing you can do. It doesn't matter if I interview Flores, uh, Hackett. If I know I'm getting Mike McDaniels and that's my guy and I'm bringing him with me, it doesn't really matter who I interview. And that's why the Rooney rule is so flawed at times. Yeah. Because it's just a checkbox for most of these people. And it's really going to take a cavalierish GM, owner, front office group to come together and say, we need more diversity. Not because we have to, but because we should want it and it benefits our company because it brings in a new perspective, a new, unique perspective to the building. I don't think it's that hard. I really don't. No. <clears throat> I, I, I really I don't. Agree with you. I, I agree with you, Adam. And number one, with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, they did a wonderful job, Bruce Arians. They have a woman uh, on the coaching staff. They have, they have multiple different minorities on their coaching staff. And the problem is you have Todd Bowles, you have Byron Leftwich. Where are they now? They're terrific candidates, but why haven't, like the Miami Dolphins, you bring up Mike McDaniels. Mike McDaniels very well might be the D Miami Dolphins head coach, and Chris Greer is their GM. And after I don't see it happening. I don't, I don't know, and Jeff, please answer this. Why would you, as a head coach, accept a job in Houston or Miami? Oh, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. After those, after those uh, claims that Brian Flores did, it's hard. It, it's hard. Yeah, I'm with you, man. I'm with you. Look, I understand the jobs are very rare, but I'm sorry. A guy like a Mike McDaniels, an Aaron Glenn, some of these guys, they're always going to be there. They're going to be available. It may not be this cycle or the next cycle, but maybe it's the third cycle. Who knows? But, again, I'm, I'm trying to talk about a, a clear problem, 
But you have to be fair. Mm -hmm. If you were a GM and you interviewed those 10 candidates, would you pick one over the other because of their color? No, that would be wrong of you. You pick the guy you believe is the best fit for your building. That's number one. Now, does that always happen? No, I'm not ignorant. I know that. I understand that. But what I also see is that Ryan Poles and now the Minnesota GM, who are African-American, have hired white head coaches. Now, you could make the argument, well, the owners probably made him do it. Then I don't know what game we're playing here anymore. Right. If the GM doesn't have the responsibility and the autonomy to make a head coaching hire... I mean, I, I don't know what to think of the NFL anymore. I really don't. And if that's the argument, good luck proving it. Right. Good luck proving it. Hard for me to buy. It really is. It really is. And now look at the Jacksonville Jaguars. How they have not named Byron Leftwich as their head coach is beyond me. It's embarrassing. Vic Fangio. <laughs> it's embarrassing. I'd rather have Fish coach my football team than Vic Fangio. <laughs> And Fish yeah. doesn't know a goddamn thing about football. And that's the, that's the <laughs> problem, Adam. You, you, Vic Fangio was with the Denver Broncos, had one, I mean, you call it successful, I guess, this season. I mean, he won, he was, he started out pretty good in the early in the season, but to finish that season how they did, and he was, he was canned, and now he's already interviewing for the Jacksonville Jaguars when you have a great, innovative, young offensive coordinator with Byron Leftwich, who's worked with the GOAT and has, he's, he's proved results, number one on the field in terms of his offense. I don't see, and he's a former player of Jacksonville. Like this, like you said, if I, I can make this decision, if I'm a, if I'm a general manager, and I have no damn experience, so this makes no sense to me. And if they want Vic Fangio to get an interview, oh my god, it just shows how dysfunctional that organization really is. I mean, we can call it dysfunction. What I I don't care what you guys want to end up calling it. All I know is that there is a problem, and I don't have a yep. solution for it, and I don't think you do either. But I think it needs to be talked about at least. So maybe, maybe we get somewhere in this. Maddie, we got to go to break. So almost mailbag time. It is almost mailbag time. But we're switching gears over to hockey when we come back. But first, we need to hear about the sports marketing agency. Yeah, listen, guys, let me tell you about our friends at the Sports Marketing Agency. And the reality is, with the Sports Marketing Agency, they've been leveraging pro athletes and other notables for a decade against the issues around mental health and substance use disorder. With the help of NFL alumni Sean Jordan, and you see our other friends on the screen, Braylon Edwards, Michael Lealy, Devin Gardner, and Lomas Brown, they're all here to help save lives and take a stand against these issues. Soon coming, We are crushing sports, views today. This has been an insane Marketing week. For a week of podcast. no football? Not bad. This is the F Word series on fentanyl. If you're struggling with substance abuse or mental health, they are here to help. Go to thesportsma.com and tell them Woodward Sports sent you. That's my six dark corners, a driveway and a patio, five windows that could become doors. Every house has unique security challenges. Guardian Alarm has more tech, more team, and more ways to help keep them all safe. Get a professionally designed and installed security and smart home system from Guardian Alarm. Sign up today and get a free video device. Guardian Alarm. Smart. Right from the start. Call 1-800-STAY-OUT. Comerica Park. Sunshine. The crack of the bat. More sunshine. Warmth. We're almost there, Detroit. Summer 2022 will be the summer of Woodward Sports. We just got to make it through this damn cold first. Welcome back. Thanks for joining us here on the Morning Woodward Show on the Woodward Sports Network. Red Wings took a tough loss last night. It was not very pretty. Jeff, you've got the Red Wings hat on today. What did you think of the game? Well, it's the second game in three games they've allowed over five goals. And, you know, you, you look at it like that. But at the end of the day, this team has a lot of room, obviously. Like, 20-21-6, um, as entertaining as they are, gave up two goals in the second and third and third period. They, they get to these slow starts, and they end up scoring multiple goals late in the game. But at the end of the game, it, it's, it's out of reach. And the Los Angeles Kings, 24-16, and 16, they're obviously in a different position than the Red Wings are right now. But at the end of the day, watching last night's game, and watching some of the players, obviously, um, Lucas Raymond didn't play his best game, and same with Mo Sider, but at the end of the day, this is what happens. Like, you, you saw, Adam was at the game the other day and, and couldn't help but praise these guys, and, and it's going to be inconsistent, but um, I'm not too worried about it. Well, my biggest concern is, and I know the Wed Wings are going to address this, 
is their defense. And especially when Nedeljkovic, listen, Nedeljkovic, you can say, yeah, they gave up five goals, but he didn't have a whole lot of help. So that's going to be a problem. But I think I'm not worried about this team long term. I mean, we talk about this all the time. The Red Wings, to me, and I'm assuming Adam, the most entertaining team entertaining team in Detroit to watch right now. So I'm not going to sit up here and, and, and bite the hand that feeds me. But at the same time, um, it, at the, this is what we expect. I don't know if they're going to make they're going to make the wild card, but they're playing hell of good uh, competing out there. But at the end of the day, they got to give some help out in Delkovich because he can't do it all by himself. Man. That D-line's got to be a little better, but I'm not worried about it. Yeah, look, man, I felt bad for Nadelkovich last night. I mean, he he fought like hell to keep them in that game. <laughs> yeah, but you did. know what, guys? I'm starting to notice something with Lucas Raymond. And to be honest with you, I'm not concerned. But boy, does he get pushed around the ice really easily. And I get it. He's a, he's a, basically, he's a boy. He's still growing up, still developing into his body. I get it. But man, you're putting him on the first line. Yes, with Larkin, sure, and Nemestikov. Sure, that's great. But how often are they skating into the zone with space? It's very, it's not often. And the shot total, again, is another example of what you've seen with the Wings all year. The opposing team gets 42, 43, 45 shots on target, and you get less than 20. And you get around 20, 21, 22. That's not good. The zone entry of the Detroit Red Wings is one of their biggest problems this year. And I don't know how you fix that. Verona, please come back. Yeah. I need you. Yeah. The team needs you. <laughs> like, look, Detroit's so we fun to watch, you. by the way, obviously. But they they need to clean it up. They need to be able to find a better way to enter the zone, especially on the first line, other than Larkin carrying it into the net and scoring. Mm-hmm. Like, that's yeah. not a recipe for success. And, again, nobody expects them to make the playoffs this year, so it's not the end of the world. But if, you're, if your reliance on getting into the zone – is Dylan Larkin on the first line and him doing everything? Good luck. Yeah. I need Raymond to be able to skate around players more. And he's not doing it enough. Yeah. And, you know, when he plays in front of the net, he gets pushed around like a rag doll. It's not even funny. He's still a young kid. And yeah. he, he's a kid that would thrive in space. He is. He, he needs space. He needs to be able to maneuver, skate a little bit more. And get shots on target. And I don't think he's aggressive enough right now, Jeff. I don't know if you've seen the same things. What do you think? No, actually, I agree with you. And Tammy brought up a great point. She just typed it in the chat. I was about to say it. Is you got to look at. We talk about uh, Jacob Rana and, and him coming back. I think him being out definitely pushed Lucas Raymond up the, the pecking order, pushing him into that first slide. So there's definitely a lot of things he needs to learn. But at the end of the day, he got his opportunity because of the injury. So it's almost a blessing and a curse. You got to see a whole lot of good. But you're, you're starting to see a little bit of that bad now, which is completely – I mean, it's, I'm not worried at all, but it's the reality of it. You know, a rookie's gotten his opportunities. He got boosted up the pack in order, and, and now he's, he's biting off a little more than he can chew. But hopefully it works out for him late in the season. But, yeah, I think the size and his age and, and, and just his – he's got to get a little more mature in the, in the NHL, physicality, which he will. I'm not worried about it, but I agree with everything you're saying. You're, you're not off on that. All right. Well, look, Jeff, I, I do want to shift real quick. We have six minutes, and I'm not sure what happens from here on out. I really don't, especially with this Malik Willis talk. But I want to go back to the Detroit Lions before we head into the break and do mailbag. Jeff, you have the option to take somebody at number two overall today. But it means you don't get a quarterback in the first round. Who do you take? And also, are you willing to A, trade back, or B, trade up to get a quarterback if you don't select him at two? What are you doing? So your question is, what player am I taking if it's not a quarterback at two? Yes. Okay. All right. Just making sure, because I'm like, I none of the above. But um, <laughs> with, with, that, with that question, it's going to be, and I've been high on it, and I'm kind of shifted towards it. I'm going to stick uh, – I was Kayvon Thibodeau for a while, and, and now – meeting him and, and understanding that listen Kayvon's a he's an incredible he has an incredible high ceiling and I think that's going to be my number two pick I'm going to stick by it I really am I'm kind of leaning towards Aiden but I'm sticking with Kayvon in terms of the ceiling now to answer your question do I see them trading back yes for Kyle Hamilton not for a quarterback I I really don't I really hope not I hope they don't trade back into the closer to the tens if they're going to take a quarterback that would absolutely be abysmal to me like for this organization you need 
uh, number one, more pieces on defense. You need a wide receiver. Now, I'm not saying take a wide receiver anywhere near that, but that's where that second first-round pick comes into play. I'm not uh, – listen, you could sit up here and say if a Sam Howell or Malik Willis falls to us, it's definitely worth considering. But we both talked about it. I don't think – and, you're, like, you're, you mailed this point. It's a quarterback leap. I don't think those guys fall all the way to the Rams pick. So if that's the case, you're taking defense, and you're probably taking defense or a wide receiver. So I, I'm sticking by it. I've always said – I don't believe it, it's it's the right way to do things when you draft, unless Look, it's a generational player. Unless it's yep. a generational player, you don't draft a quarterback into a situation like this and even sit him for a year and say, all right, take us to victory. I, I like our bridge quarterback. Leave him here and build a team. Yeah, no, I'm with you, Jeff. Look, at the end of the day, whether it's Thibodeau or Hutchinson, you know what, honestly? So I've been, I've been digging up a little bit. I'm not sure how much of the person matters. I think it matters a lot for me, at least. But... I'm feeling more confident, if that's the word. I'm more confident in them taking Hutchinson at two than Thibodeau. And I hope Thibodeau is off the board number one overall so they fall into Hutchinson because am I getting a diva defensive end? I need a leader. I need a guy that's going to be a stalwart player in my defense for years to come. And look, do they trade back and go for Kyle Hamilton? Who knows? But I've brought this up so many times, and I'm tired of doing it. Who is the safety in the NFL that is changing games on a week-to-week basis? There aren't any. Not even Tyron Matthew. Not even Kevin Byard. It's typically edge rushers and quarterbacks, and now wide receivers in today's NFL. Go find those players. I like Kyle Hamilton. I think he's absolutely and one of, if not the better prospects I've seen come out of college in a long time. Having said that, I am not paying a, a, my first overall pick, basically, 9 to $10 million a year as a rookie to play safety. When he's not even engaging at the line of scrimmage, he makes no impact on the game until it comes yeah. to him or he makes a play. Instead, I have an edge rusher who can stop the run, get to the quarterback, hurt the quarterback, sack him, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Alter throws, alter arm angles. That's what you need. You need a pass rusher. Maddie, we got to go to break. When we get back, whew, We've it's going to be fun. Mailbag. mailbag, get the questions mailbag, in. Get those There's questions a question in. right now, and I like it from one funky fan. So that'll be the first one we answer out of the break. All right. Well, we'll answer your question when we come back. But first, we need to talk about Lady Jane's. Well, listen, guys, as you can see, uh, I got the hat on, and I need a haircut desperately bad. So Lady Janes can help me with that, of course. And let's be honest, guys, we like simple stuff. We like football five days a week, and we also like things uncomplicated. And like Lady Janes, haircuts for men. Walk in, you sign in, you sit down. And as you can see in these graphics, it's a wonderful environment. You sit down, you get to watch your favorite sports teams, and before you know it, you're handsome and clean. Get to Lady Janes, open 10 to 8, seven days a week. Walk in any time because it is wicked awesome. Life is full of hard choices. We're here to make one of life's biggest decisions as simple as possible. My name is Christina Gennari, and for over 20 years, I've helped hundreds of families buy and sell homes. We cover all of Metro Detroit and more, from large luxury homes to starter homes. We will work hard to make sure that you get the home of your dreams. So if you're in the market today or even thinking about buying or selling in the future, make the obvious choice. Christina Gennari, the obvious choice in real estate. Visit us at soldchristina.com today. Get a shot up. This is for the win. All of Detroit sports teams live on Woodward. All of Detroit sports coverage lives on Woodward Sports. Driving the best in Detroit sports coverage. Welcome back. Thanks for tuning in to the Morning Woodward Show here on the Woodward Sports Network. It's mailbag time, and our first question is from Funky in the chat. Adam, can you name an elite defense that doesn't have a stud safety? Funky, I agree with you 100%. Tennessee, good defense, Kevin Byard. Tampa Bay, good defense. They have Antoine Winfield uh, Jr. I agree with you 1,000%. The problem is none of them are taking number two overall. That is the problem. Byard is a third-round pick. Winfield, end of the first round. And if you look at the top 15 players at wide receiver and the top 15 players at safety... 13 of the 15 top, or excuse me, yeah, 13 of the 15 top 15 wide receivers are first-round picks. Only two of the top 15 safeties 
our first round picks. The rest are second, third, fourth, and fifth round picks. That's why I can't take Kyle Hamilton on number two. Even if that goes against football logic, I don't care. I can't justify paying a rookie $9 million a year to play safety. When I just saw Winfield get torched by Cooper Cup against the Rams in the divisional round. When I just saw the Bills and the Chiefs go in a shootout into overtime and no safety could even stop Gabriel Davis. That's why you don't take Kyle Hamilton, even though he is arguably the best defensive prospect in this draft. That's why you can't take him at number two. It is a luxury pick. The Giants can take him. The Jets can take him. The Eagles can take him. The Lions can't. They need an edge rusher. It's that simple. All right. What other questions do we have in here? Adam, will you dance with a goat mask if the Rams win the Super Bowl? Jack? Oh, he's eight times stepping up You that. are not ready for me. No one's ready for that. Oh, boy. I, I, I have been planning. Do you, you, so you do have I a have plan? been scheming up what's next. Good. First, it was just, you know, the cigar. Yep. The casual professional glasses. Second, it was the dancers, the hookah, the goat mask. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to up it. I'm going to keep upping it. So, yeah, if they win the Super Bowl, I may f- literally burn the studio down. I may bring in a flamethrower. Who knows? Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm going to be so unbearable, honestly. I can't oh, wow. It. Charles McClain. Adam, new rankings came out, and Kayvon is number six on the board. Where would you rank him at? You know what? Honestly, from the, just the articles I've written, and the one scout, only one scout I've talked to, Kayvon seems to have that selfish individual trait that may... That may prevent him from reaching his full potential. And Can I add that to that, scares too? The sh- that scares the hell out of me. Yeah, and, I sound the same without caffeine, but I don't feel the same without caffeine. Let me tell you, I am not happy. Do I look happy? Because I'm not. <laughs> Thanks, Don. What a good friend you are. Oh my God. Adam, can I, can I add to Adam that Kayvon statement? Adam will be hey, Valentine's Adam, Day theme. Uh, Jeff is trying to say something. Oh, I'm sorry. Jeff, what's up, buddy? <laughs> no, I, I just want to add to the Kayvon statement because Easy told me this story, and this is what made me change my, I mean, not completely outlook on Kayvon, but when, he, when Easy went and visited Kayvon at Pro Sports Zone, shout out to Tammy, by the way, for hooking him up with that. He said he, he talked to Kayvon, and it just quickly was, you know, messing with him, and he said, you know, when you get to Detroit, or if you do, um, I want to be your first interview, like messing with him. And, and he looked over at Easy and said, hopefully I don't come to Detroit. Like, oh, my I, God. I, I'm not sure, really? I'm not sure if he said that, and Easy said this, I'm not sure if he was talking about the weather or uh, I don't know if he's if he's not the, you know an East Coast guy, but in terms of the organization, I wouldn't be surprised. And if he says that, it makes your point. Yikes. Being selfish. So. I mean, if, the, if that was, look, I don't know. If that is the response, that's pretty pathetic, and that's why you take Aiden Hutchinson. I know I'm getting a leader. I know I'm getting a guy that's going to work the hardest in the building. That is the safe pick in terms of I know what I'm getting. Kyle Hamilton, what kind of impact can he make on Sunday? Now, is he the new generational safety that can make an impact, and he paves the way for safeties to become really valuable assets of a football team? Maybe. I'm not taking that risk at number two. I'm not. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure as hell not taking a quarterback at number two. Oh, my God. Honestly, I may jump off a of Ford Field if they take a quarterback at number two. To be honest with all of you, you may never see me again. I will not be there for the Friday show if they take a quarterback at number two. <laughs> and I won't even write you a goodbye message. This is my <laughs> goodbye message to all of you. Clip it. <laughs> Clip it from now. This is my goodbye message if they take a quarterback at number two. I couldn't handle it. I really couldn't. Uh, let's see. I would rather have Neil over either of the two hyped edge rushers. Personally, I don't think Hutch is the perfect fit. Uh, you know what, Funky? That is a great point. Scheme-wise, he is not a good fit, or I, I would argue the perfect fit. But again, you you, you got to get pressure on the quarterback. Now, you yeah. want to get Nick Benito in the second, uh, late second, third round? You have to trade up? Who knows? Who knows? But again... Are you able to trade back? And I think if I, if the Lions are able to trade back, my goodness, I would feel so much better. And if they could trade back, I'd be okay with a Kyle Hamilton. Yes, I would at six. I would at five. Not at two. Not the second player that comes off the board. The second player that comes off the board better be a damn near borderline Hall of Famer. 
And sorry, those are the expectations, whether people like it or not. I hear the Lions are falling in love with a tight end at the Senior Bowl. Gromit, I want to know who this tight end is. I have a 12 gauge a at home. I'll make sure this doesn't happen. <laughs> uh, All right, I'm saying some stuff I probably shouldn't say, to be honest with you. It's because you haven't had coffee. It's well, fine. Don, this is what you get. So, guys, fault. get used to it because until a black coach is hired, I'm not going to have coffee in me. Jesus Christ. All right, Kayvon equals Jalen Green, honestly. Personality wise, you may be spot on. Yeah. Who knows? What other questions? Jeff, do we have anything in here, buddy? Um, I see. Oh, if Drake London is there in the late twenties, are you trading up? What was it? I'm sorry, you cut off, Jeff. No, if, if Drake London is there in the late twenties, right. I'm going to ask a question since up? nobody wants to ask questions right now. He's he's talking. Oh, <laughs> it keeps he keeps cutting out for me. He said, um, "Where did I go? Are you sure if your Drake London is the there in the late twenties? Are you trading up?" If Malik Willis Drake. is available, or Drake, Drake London. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Did you have Gypsy this These morning? Suck. Are you sure? These suck. These <laughs> suck. Right. Okay, so, Anyways, so it's the headphones yes. that are bad Do I trade up to get Drake London? Oh, that's tricky. I think so, yeah. What do I have to give up? I think that's really the question. If I don't have to give up much to trade up two, three, four slots at the end of the first round, I'm doing it. What do you think, Jeff? Uh, I, I'd agree. I mean, listen, it depends how far, uh, how far, <laughs> far he falls, obviously. But with Drake London... I like him as a prospect, and, and listen, I wouldn't have a problem with him in Detroit at all. It just depends where you take him, and what do you give up for him? All right, a new question. Does Jim Harbaugh stay longer at U of M? Fish, I will punch you in the face. Adam, does Harbaugh stay long at U of M? I don't know. Long term? I don't think... I think so, yeah. I really don't... But again, guys, if the Arizona job opens up and Kyler Murray's available, does he not put his hat... Or his name in the uh, in the hat basket, or whatever the hell they call it, whatever the term is. The hat basket. I have no coffee this morning. <laughs> Honestly, I have no idea what the hell you guys want from oh me. God. We're two hours into this goddamn show. I have had zero coffee. I've been up since five. <laughs> Don't make me swear at the end of the show. Well, see you later. <laughs> oh, Jesus my gosh. Christ. Adam, are we gonna party hard at the Stafford Bowl? Hell yeah, we are. You guys are gonna get to see the Adam that drinks, not the Adam that drinks coffee. I'm talking about the other kind of drink. Well, I hope you have coffee that day, too. Oh, don't worry. Oh, I'll cheat. He probably Don, can't. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. if, if Stafford wins the, the Super Bowl, I'm cheating that day. But anyways, we got to go. I hope you all have a fantastic Thursday. It's Friday Eve, as Maddie would say. I didn't even say it. I, I, I have to say it. I have and to say it. And there's a big event happening tomorrow morning, which What's you tomorrow? guys know I'll be up. The Olympic opening ceremony, ding dong. No, well, there's a big event Ooh. happening today. It's my dodgeball championship. Well, Shout that. out to yep. the Sloan Dodge Millionaires. <laughs> That's I'll be a champion tomorrow. Fish, only I'm... champions. Only champions. Yes, Adam. Champions only. Fish. Yep. I didn't have coffee. Now's not the time. <laughs> okay. <All right. laughs> Just saying the Olympics. I don't want to hurt you, but I love you. But sometimes sure you have to you hurt do. the people you love. You know that? Yes, I'm aware of that. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, have a great Thursday. Alex, thank you so much. Jeff, I hope you enjoy your snow day. Maybe Ugh. we'll probably do this again tomorrow from a snow day, you lucky, uh, you lucky, no, sexy no, looking listen, guy. I love that frame behind be you, by the way. Studio. I'll probably be in studio. Thank you. Hell yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Have a great Thursday. We're out of here. <laughs>